Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so sorry for the uh, issues yesterday with the uh, camera being sideways. So I'm going to go back through Daniel chapter 5 today uh, in a new video. Um, some of you all may not be awake yet, and that's fine. Uh, we've got food pantry here in about an hour and a half, so be in prayer for that. Uh, great ministry that, that we have going on there. So uh, so let's jump back into uh, Daniel chapter 5. What does it all mean? Uh, so Scott has already taken you through the first four chapters of uh, the book of Daniel, and that uh, dealt a lot with King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 5, we see the, the shift in kings from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar, not to be confused with Belteshazzar, and Belteshazzar is uh, Daniel. So Belshazzar is, is the king uh, that we read about in Daniel chapter 5, and uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, prophetic message that happens almost immediately, uh, which is uh, crazy because usually there's there's a gap between prophetic messages and, and the event of that message, but uh, but the message uh, that uh, Daniel shares with Bel to, with Belshazzar, I would consider it pretty immediate. It happens pretty fast. So what what's been going on? Um, so we know in the first four chapters, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He ruled over Babylon for roughly forty years, uh, six hundred five to five hundred sixty two. Then after. Uh, after Nebuchadnezzar, one of his sons ruled for a short time, uh, Amel Marduk, uh, from 563 to 561. And then after Marduk, uh, his brother-in-law, Nir Glyser, ruled for about three years, from 560 to 556. And then Nabonidus, from 556 to 539, came to power. And Nabonidus was away a lot, and his son Belshazzar, ruled as co-regent with his father from 553 until 539. So as, as we go to chapter 5 in the book of Daniel, I'm going to go ahead and read it, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, Daniel's in the Old Testament, right? Yes, yes it is. Give me one second to find it here. There we go. It was a little bit further back than I remembered. So Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar's feast. So let's read here. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. 
the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of, en of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. So now we move into uh, Daniel in interpreting this uh, handwriting on the wall. So, uh, but before he interprets, he kind of rebukes, uh, not kind of, he does uh, rebuke uh, uh, Belshazzar. And it's kind of funny to read. I enjoy reading this part of it. Uh, so this is what Daniel says. So then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O King, the Most High God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive, and whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beast, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven, till he recognized that the Most High God is the ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Many, many to kill a parson. Many, God has numbered your kingdom. Or this is the, let me start back in verse 25. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Many, many to kill a parson. This is the interpretation of the message. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. To kill, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about age 
at about the age of 62. So we need to understand that between chapter four and chapter five, there's been about 25 years. And this makes uh, a Daniel uh, roughly 80 years old, uh, give or take a few years. And so what are some things that, that we can learn from Daniel chapter five? We can learn a lot out of Daniel chapter five. Um, the, the importance of humility, uh, the, the importance of remaining faithful to God, uh, which uh, is something that we are going to talk about. Uh, three things uh, involving faith, actually. Uh, God wants us to have faith during the silence. God wants us to grow in faith by remembering. And God wants us to demonstrate faith in prosperity. So that first point, God wants us to have faith during times of silence. Daniel remembers the powerful works that God has done like they were yesterday. Uh, this is one of the things that helps Daniel to continue to grow in faith. And we should keep that mindset that we need to remember what God has done for us uh, so we can continue to grow in that faith, not always looking back on the negative of things, but looking at the positive of things, of how God has carried us through our storms. And I just uh, want to say this, that just because God is silent does not mean that God is distant from you. So uh, Pastor Scott, he, he enjoys going through the, the narrative books of the Bible. He enjoys a good life event. Uh, but when we go through the narratives, the things that God wants to teach us are not always given to us in propositional form, like in the letters of the New Testament, but are more to be uh, mined like for gold or diamonds. And to do that requires us to pray and meditate on these passages. So let's go ahead and take a moment and pray. Now, Father God, Lord, we thank you for this, this day that you've blessed us with. Lord, help us to study, <laughs> excuse me, to study your word and to hide in our and to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, uh, we thank you for the freedom that we have to study your word and to freely share it with others. Lord, help us uh, or remind us to have faith even in the times that you are silent, Lord. Pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, in his holy name. Amen. So how was God using Daniel during these 25 years? Earlier, I said that uh, between chapters 4 and 5, there's about a 25-year gap. And this isn't the only time of silence that we see uh, in the Bible. Um, there's other events in the Old Testament. We see God being silent. Uh, during uh, Job's trials, uh, we see uh, God being silent uh, uh, from the time frame uh, between Malachi uh, and Matthew, the uh, last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament. Uh, between that time frame, there's a period of 400 years to where God is silent, but that does not mean God was not acting. So, so God oftentimes is silent, but not distant. We even see him silent where, uh, when Jesus is on the cross. And we even see God just being silent when Jesus was in the tomb for three days. But when God wants to speak, God knows how to speak. So how was God using Daniel during these 25 years that we don't see anything happening? Was he using Daniel? I think, yes, he was using Daniel. How he was using Daniel, I don't know. Uh, we do know that Daniel certainly did not have the influence that he once had under King uh, Nebuchadnezzar because Belshazzar does not even know him, which is kind of ridiculous to think about that Belshazzar being the son of Nebuchadnezzar does not know Daniel. After everything Nebuchadnezzar went through, 
how could Belshazzar not know Daniel? That seems a little ridiculous in my head. And, and it just shows maybe the arrogance and pride of Belshazzar that he, he just kind of kept to himself. So, but the fact of the matter is that the text does not tell us what God was doing in and through Daniel. But we do know this. God was still Daniel's God. And Daniel was still faithful, even though there appears to be a long span of silence from God. And that is something that God wants from all of us, is to have faith during the silence. That is the mark of faithfulness. That is what separates the truly faithful from the circumstantial circumstantially faithful. Do we remain faithful even when God doesn't seem to be speaking or doing anything extra, extraordinary in our lives? God certainly used Daniel powerfully, powerfully during Nebuchadnezzar's reign, but now it seems not so much. Not only does God not seem to do anything through Daniel for a very long time, I am sure that circumstances weren't as good for Daniel without the influence he used to have. But even so, Daniel maintains faith during the silence as evidenced by his uh, responses to the king when he's offered uh, position and power again. Uh, Daniel 5.17 says this, Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Daniel didn't care about the gifts. I think that is Daniel's mindset. His ultimate mindset was the will of God. That is what Daniel desired to do. And that is what Daniel does. Despite the gifts, he says, keep them. I don't want them. So Daniel doesn't answer in a way that will produce special favors from the king. He's not looking to get his place back. He answers in a way that shows he is still trusting in God as the one true God. So some questions to think about. Have you ever had a time in your life when God seemed to be silent? How do we stay faithful during those times when God seems to be silent? And how do we continue to follow during long periods of not only silence, but circumstances that deteriorate? Because quite frankly, uh, that is not easy. So let's back up to the first question. Have you ever had a time in your life when God seemed to be silent? Everyone should be able to answer, I, I think, yes to this. There may be multiple times, uh, some of them being very personal and some may be very shareable. Um, I would hope that you would be willing to share those stories because it is a testimony uh, uh, to God's glory of how you remained faithful during times of trials, during times of silence, I should say. Uh, for me, man, praying for a wife, God was silent on that for a while. So I started trying to do things my own way, uh, dating uh, girls I probably should not have been dating. But then God blessed me with Leah. Because... I had stopped dating and I started remaining faithful to God and waiting for God to answer my prayer. And he answered me with Leah. Uh, so that, that was definitely a, a time when God was silent in my life was when I kept praying for a wife and there seemed to be no answer. Uh, so how do we stay faithful during those times when God seems to be silent? Prayer. Seems like the one thing every Christian forgets to do is go to God in prayer. Take everything to him. Cast your burdens on him for he cares for you too. Prayer is important to the, to the Christian lifestyle. It is one of, if not the most important spiritual discipline. You may have forgotten to read your Bible one day. 
but you can always pray. Let there not be a day that goes by that we do not seek the Lord in prayer. Yes, reading the Bible is important, and there are times I've forgotten to read the Bible, but there has never been a day where I've forgotten to pray. And if I have, um, then I, I just pray again. <laughs> um, but it, it seems like it's, it's easier to pray than it is to read the Word of God, uh, which we often hear about that uh, people have a hard time by setting a, a, a daily a devotional or, or a daily quiet time to just simply read the Word of God. Uh, I know I've struggled with that, um, but prayer has never really been a struggle for me. Uh, prayer has become such a habit I can be driving to work in the morning and I'll just pray. I could be driving uh, uh, from work to home and be praying. I could be walking from my office to the fellowship hall and I would just pray. I don't have to sit down with a book and read, but I can still be in relationship with God because of prayer. So prayer, stay faithful during those times when God seems to be silent. Um, I, I'm thinking of a man by the name of Pastor Saeed Abedini. I'm not sure if he's pastoring anymore, but uh, year, several years ago, he was imprisoned in the Middle East for his Christian faith, for sharing the gospel. Um, if you have a chance, look up his testimony, Pastor Saeed Abedini. Uh, his wife gave a testimony uh, several years ago while he was still imprisoned, and she gave a testimony at Liberty University. Uh, so look that up. Um, but Pastor Saeed, um, I don't remember from his story uh, if he was in prison with other men um, or what, but I do know that he was imprisoned and that it seemed as though God had been silent during his imprisonment. But God was still moving. People were still praying for him, and he ended up being released. So. So remain faithful by praying. Remain in that close relationship with God, that, that closeness that God desires to have with us, we should desire to have with him. So how do we continue to follow during long periods of not only silence, but in circumstances that deteriorate uh, because it simply isn't that easy? I don't know, it's, it's not easy. Everything around you could be falling apart. Uh, I guess I'll just encourage you to uh, surround yourself with good Christian men and women that, that can pray for you, that can encourage you, that can lift you up. Because it's, it's easier to go through something with someone than it is to go through something with no one. Uh, we see that going back to the book of Job. Uh, the first thing his friends did, uh, I think it was for a few days, was they just sat in silence. They were just there. You don't have to say something. Just be there. Um, and if someone says that they'll be there for you, accept that. Uh, let them be there for you. Again, there doesn't have to be a conversation, but just knowing the presence of someone physically there. Yes, Jesus is always there with us because he uh, is with us, but we don't see Jesus physically. So yeah, uh, surround yourself with, with a group of people or, or maybe that one accountability partner that you may have or just that one really close friend. So uh, the next point is God wants us to grow in faith by remembering how God has blessed in the past. So this is coming out of Daniel 5, 18 through 22. And it says, uh, this is uh, where uh, Daniel is rebuking Belshazzar. He says, O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the people's nations and men of every language feared and trembled before him. 
whomever he wished he killed and whomever he wished he spared a life and whomever he wished he elevated and whomever he wished he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beast and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the most high and God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all of this. Man, verse 22, that hits me every time I read it. Yet you, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all of this. You knew everything going on and you refused to humble yourself. So by remembering the things uh, he has done through others and in ourselves, we can grow in faith and be encouraged to remain faithful even during times of silence. Now, reading chapter five, no one will argue that Belshazzar is a man of faith. There is no way he is a believer in the one true God. It is very clear he is paganistic. Uh, he is polytheistic. He believes in uh, multiple gods. And we read that. Uh, uh, he doesn't rebuke uh, uh, his leaders as they uh, approach him uh, when they talk about Daniel. Uh, because uh, and, and listen to what they uh, do so. The uh, first thing I want to bring out is uh, in chapter five and verse four. It says they drank the wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Six false gods they praised. And then uh, his people started talking about Daniel, bringing Daniel in to. Uh, it gives the interpretation about this writing on the wall. And these people said that uh, Daniel has been blessed by the gods. No, he hasn't. Daniel has been blessed by the one true God. But King Belshazzar was clearly paganistic and polytheistic. And, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, paganistic meaning that he worshipped uh other false gods, polytheistic, meaning he worshiped multiple gods, poly meaning, meaning many, whereas Christians, we are uh, monotheistic. Uh, and I just lost a video for some reason. Uh, it says I'm still there. Uh, not sure what happened. Still says I'm recording, so I'll go ahead and continue uh, and uh, see if the video pops back up. If not, uh, I don't really know what to do. So I'll, I'll continue. So, uh, however, the evidence for faith was available to him just like it is available to us. God gives Belshazzar an opportunity to repent with this writing on the wall. And God gives us an opportunity to repent. Uh, with every second we live, we have the opportunity to repent and come into a knowing, saving relationship with the Lord our God. The letter to the Romans tells us that man is without excuse because God has revealed things to us about who he is. It is our responsibility to see it and respond to it. So Belshazzar has seen the truth of who God is and his power, not only in creation and through his conscience like we all have, but he knew some of the special revelation of God's work through his family. So Daniel re reminds Belshazzar of this, that he knew these things, but he chose not to remember this. So what is interesting here is that Belshazzar, who is not a person of faith, has a lot of material wealth and ease of life up until this night. And Daniel, who is a person of faith, 
has lost a lot of influence and power over the years, but remains faithful. Uh, we would have probably been asking, what is the deal with that? Why is Belshazzar being blessed and why am I not? Maybe even questioning if God is real. But we don't see that from Daniel. Uh, this is because Daniel continues to remember the mighty works God has done, and he is able to maintain perspective on the whole life. We as people tend to be very short-sighted. We live in the moment and we lose perspective regarding life. When we remember what God has done in our life, as well as in the lives of others, it helps us to maintain perspective. This is why it is important to know God's word as well. These narratives, these stories of these saints are basically testimonies that have been recorded so that we can learn and remember what God has done how God has worked so we can remain faithful. So maybe you are going through a period of, uh, of silence from God or what seems to be silence from God. Maybe it seems that at a point God was really doing some amazing things through you and now it seems as though nothing is happening. In fact, maybe even your circumstances have gotten worse in your life. Maybe you've lost your job. Uh, with this whole COVID thing, a lot of people lost jobs. Maybe you've lost your house. Maybe you have cancer or some other disease. Maybe you're having issues at home. Maybe you're having financial issues. Uh, maybe you are even asking questions like, what have I done? How have I sinned? Am I doing something wrong? And these are good questions to ask yourself during a time of silence. To reflect on your life, are you living in a right, of a right relationship with God? Are you walking worthy in a manner according to the gospel, it's good to take a spiritual inventory. This is where God wants us to step back, examine our lives, examine our hearts, so that we may be considered worthy to do his work. And if you don't hear a response, it's okay. Remain faithful. Continue to follow after God, uh, continuing in his work, continuing in prayer, and continuing to remember the work he has done. When we have done that, when we have remembered what God has done and been strengthened, then we will also be able to live out our faith in times of prosperity. Uh, because God wants us to demonstrate faith during times of prosperity, and that's our third point. Faith in times of prosperity. And it may seem a little counterintuitive. If things are going well, isn't it easy to have faith? That may seem a little counterintuitive. Uh, Pastor Scott says that he would argue that it is not. Uh, he, Pastor Scott says uh, he thinks it is easiest to walk in faith when we neither have too much or too little. And Pastor Scott not only says that, but the word of God says that in Proverbs 30, it says, uh, two things I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. But even so, there will be times in all of our lives when we either have much or have little, and God wants us to rely and trust in him, living in faith and demonstrating that faith. Belshazzar's prosperity has exposed his lack of faith in the Lord and his faith in himself and his stuff. While Belshazzar knew the work of God and the power of God, he trusted in his prosperity, and Daniel says that he has set himself up against the Lord of heaven. What does that mean? Uh, how did he do that? Uh, in scripture, when we, when we read in chapter 5, it says that Belshazzar is having a huge party for roughly a thousand people. And so it's, it's a huge party. It's very extravagant. Uh, he even uh, calls for these, uh, these goblets, these cups that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And now he's drinking from these goblets. So he's, he has dishonored God by doing this. And what we don't see from the text, uh, but we know from history, is we know that the Babylonians knew that outside the city walls uh, was camped the Medo-Persian army. 
And so why would you have a party when the enemy is camping at the gates? Because of pride. It's what it is. And what happens? Pride cometh before the fall, right? And in the city of Babylon, it was, it is or was an extremely impressive city. Nebuchadnezzar had built walls all around the city that were massive. The walls were at least 75 feet high and wide enough that a four-horse chariot could turn around on the top of it. Uh, you may even be familiar with the uh, one of the great wonders of the world, uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar had made. Uh, Babylon was, it was just an extremely impressive city. Uh, there was a moat on the outside of the wall, and the, and the Euphrates River ran through the city, and the wall was built over it in such a way that people or armies could not get through. The wall of Babylon surrounded even farmland that allowed them to raise their own crops, and they had supplies that would feed the city for years. In fact, Belshazzar had so much faith in his stuff, he exalted himself. And so why shouldn't he be drinking out of the goblets fit for a god, or really fit for the god? So they, they get these gold and silver goblets uh, that were taken from the temple by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he exalts himself and sets himself up against the Lord of heaven, saying, I am like you. It's kind of almost reiterates uh, the mindset of Satan, where Satan... Uh, wants to be God. So that is when we move into the writing on the wall for Belshazzar. Many, many tekel a parson. Uh, many meaning that your days have been numbered. And all of our days are numbered. Appointed unto man is, is to die. From dust you are made to dust you shall return. We are going to die. Some people sooner than others. Some people live long, long lives. But sooner or later, we will die. Our physical bodies will cease. So his, his days have been numbered. Tekel, uh, you have been weighed. You've been found deficient. And, uh, and then a parson, you have been found wanting. Uh, your, your kingdom has been divided, is what uh, Perez means, or a parson, is what that means. So Daniel interprets the writing for Belshazzar, and who knew that in the same night that this interpretation was made that uh, Belshazzar would be killed. His days were numbered. Our days are numbered. We don't know when our life will cease. But we will always have a chance to repent in this earthly life. After death, that's it. There is no chance for repentance. And instead of a party, Belshazzar should have been organizing a prayer vigil, seeking the Lord's wisdom and honoring him, but that's not what Belshazzar does. So if God were, were to be writing on your wall, what would God be saying? Would he write, a well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Come and share the joy of your master's kingdom. Or would you be saying the words that Belshazzar saw? that your days have been numbered, that, uh, that you have been weighed and found deficient, uh, and that your kingdom has been divided. Uh, when we studied this in youth group, I, I went a different route, and I want to ask these, these, this question. If you knew how long you had left to live, how would you spend that time? How would you spend that time? Would you spend it in repentance, which Belshazzar didn't? He knew his days were numbered. And he spends it partying. 
but Jesus leading up to his death did two things. He washed the disciples' feet and he prayed in the garden. He worshiped God and that is what prayer is, is worshiping God through prayer, having that communication with God. And he served. I think that's where we have it right at New Life. Worship, serve, or worship, grow, and serve. Our days are numbered. So we should always be worshiping the Lord our God. We should always be growing in our relationship with him. And we should be serving him to glorify his kingdom. So worship, grow, and serve. So let's pray that God would tell each of us what the writing on our wall would be and for the strength to respond to it. So let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you for the study in your word. Pray, Father, that we take it to heart, that we cast our pride and our arrogance away from us so that we may uh, be a better use to glorify your kingdom, Lord, whatever we are working through in our lives, Father. Let us be attentive to your spirit so that we may hear you when you do speak. You are silent, but not far. And Lord, when you do speak, let us respond in a way that glorifies you, Father. I pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in his holy name. Amen. So I don't know why, but it's saying that there's trouble with this video. For some reason, I lost a video feed. Uh, so I guess it's as good as it's going to get for now. Uh, sorry for the issues. Uh, have a good day, and I hope you all enjoy this uh, Bible study.